Okay, sorry, there was no, like, welcome back. Okay. Welcome. <laughs> sorry, Theora, stop laughing. You got this, Caitlin. You're doing great. I know, I, I got to write. We're all of this is left in. All of it. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome <laughs> to our clunky introduction. Yeah, Theora knows that if she doesn't write it out, I won't say it. Yeah. Okay, so now that we said hello, we are beyond thrilled to have Joshua Gonzalez join us today. Joshua is an artist that wears many hats, including actor, content creator, and writer. We are super excited to talk to you today and talk about your new book called Keep Sweet. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me on. This is so exciting. Thank you so much. I'm excited. Yes, we're very excited because Joshua was very kind and sent us a copy of his book. So we got to read it and we super love it. Um, our first question, though, is we're wondering, like, why did you decide to write the book? Sure, big, that is a great thing. question. Yeah. Uh, I actually, it started as a gratitude exercise during the pandemic. Uh, I, you know, had a lot of time on my hands. Uh, I'm, I was an actor and theater maker. And so the entertainment industry, you know, was on pause. And uh, I started just writing things that I was grateful for, writing things that had happened in my life that I, you know, was really, that changed me, that moved me, that inspired me, that made me who I am. And then it got to the point where one of my friends was like, hey, this is like a lot of really cool stuff. Maybe you have a book here. And I was like, I don't know. I don't, con I never considered myself a writer uh, um, until now. And I was like, maybe. So I just kept writing and see where it went. And my kind of thought process was always, I'm going to take this as far as I can. And if at any point along the way it dies, then it dies. But here we are. And there's a whole real book, physical book and digital ebook and everything. And it's here and it's happened. So I guess I, I, I did it. <laughs> you did. I love how organic that was. And how do we thank that friend? Oh, he is so wonderful. His name is Edward Rice. You can, you can find him on the socials. He's really great. Um, and yes, he deserves a lot of uh, the praise and the thanks for, for the, making this happen. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you, friend out there. <laughs> yes, thank you. It's a, it's a really good book. It is. Oh, thank you. So the book is an independently published book. So my first mm -hmm. question is, why did you decide to independently publish it? Yes. Um, my journey through the publishing world is very unique and, and very um, interesting, I would say, I think. Uh, so I actually, I had almost no idea what the publishing world was like, you know, I had never written a book, I, I had never been in that world before. But I, ha it's very similar to the entertainment industry, you know, you, you can get your agent, they get you the gigs and or similarly, you know. Uh, so I started researching it and found the community on Twitter a little bit and kind of felt out the steps that I needed to take. And I had initially planned on traditionally publishing because I had no idea how to do how to publish a book myself and i ended up querying during 2020 or 2021 which is a crazy time to be doing that in 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 the world and uh i got an agent eric myers from eric myers literary who's who has been incredible and a huge champion of the book throughout this entire process and we ended up going on submission in 2021 in the in the spring of that year and that was right when we were getting into a lot of supply chain issues and the paper shortages and the publishing industry was going through a lot of its own and cutting staff and cutting acquisitions left and right uh, and so it was a very tumultuous time and it got to the point where i had a few editors who were very interested in it and I thank them. They were so, so much great feedback from so many awesome editors, dream editors at like dream houses that I could only imagine being published at. And the reality of the situation was they were like, you know, I try again in like six, seven months when like things are a little more settled around here. And then in my head, I was like, that is so wonderful and encouraging. 
However, I don't know if I physically can stand waiting seven months and then a whole another year, year and a half for the whole long traditional publication process. And so um, with my agent's blessing, he's very supportive, I decided to pull the book from submission and just take a run at doing it myself. Because I was like, you know, I've... I put on productions, I put on shows, I've, I, I, I kind of know how to project manage something that's artistic. Maybe I could do this too. And so here we are. So basically you're like, I think I can do it. Let's just do it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. What advice uh, do you have for new authors who are thinking about independently publishing? Like, how do you even do that? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, what is so cool and what is so great about all of the resources and tools that we have now on the internet, on YouTube, on podcast, you can find all of the like education and the learnings that you need to, to do it. But also what the advice that I would give would be to really sit and think about how you want to do it because you can do it in so many different ways and and think about what success looks like for you and then kind of go down that path you know for some people success to them looks like having their book in barnes and noble or target sometimes success to them is just having to someone is just having the book out there in the world and having their best friend read it or be able or just seeing their book on Amazon or or something of that nature. And so depending on what path you want to go down, there's there is a path for you. You can find it. You can do it yourself. There's so many great resources out there. And honestly from from what I have found, the community, the the um indie author community on Twitter, on Reddit, on there's like some Slack channels I'm a part of. Everyone is so incredibly supportive and is willing to help and you can make it happen. And there are also kind of, I will say like a scale, a sliding scale of the amount of effort you can put in depending on what you want. So, you know, if you don't think you have a lot of time or a lot of energy to devote to it, there's a point on that scale for you. If you want to go all out, there's a point on that scale for you as well. It, it's been a very fulfilling experience. Sounds like you can get out of it whatever you want to put into it. And so there's a lot exactly. of freedom with it. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. So speaking of the book a little bit, uh, you mm -hmm. mentioned in the book that <clears throat> when you were growing up, you really wanted to see somebody represented in media that was more like you instead of like the run of the mill straight Caucasian Abercrombie models. I love that description because it's so like, <laughs> spot on. So um, we basically we created this podcast because we think representation in media is very important. And so we wanted to hear your take on that. Like, why is it so important? Oh, my gosh, it is. It is. Oh, it's a it's so, I, where do I where do I begin? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know it's a big, big question. Like, <laughs> what is the meaning like, of the universe? The, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, what's the meaning of life? <laughs> you can answer that too if you have the answer. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Um, <laughs> Damn it. Damn. <laughs> But I think the answer to this question for me, or the way I would answer it, is a little twofold. So for one, it is important for those of us who, who haven't gotten as much representation to see ourselves in all of these situations, particularly, particularly successful situations, so that we can understand that that is available to us and we can achieve the same dreams and goals that everyone else has or that everyone else who is usually portrayed has and can. Oh, that's a tough answer. Sorry. Um, and so there's like that side, like everyone needs to see that they can do what they want and like achieve their goals and have their dreams. But I also think the second, the second point, is that it is so important for everyone else to see other people also be able to like live that life. It just builds that empathy with other people who are don't look like them, who are queer or not queer, who male, female, any genders in between, no genders. Like 
it, it is just so important for everyone to be exposed to different people and to see like the possibilities when we are able to work together, when we are able to love together, when we are able to just take all the best pieces from everyone and put it together to build something great. As a theater maker, especially working with third rail projects, which if you don't know is a very, it, we are an immersive theater company and we devise a lot of our works. And a lot of that process is going into a room with a whole bunch of different artists and kind of working and figuring things out and like, oh, taking this thing from this person. Oh, taking this thing from this person, taking this choreographed movement from this person and kind of remixing it, dividing it back up, putting it all together. And that's how you get the most brilliant works that I have seen. It's really that collaboration. And I think there's a little kind of metaphor in there of what we should be doing in the world and in real life. Yeah, I was just thinking like the, th the line you hear in like corporate HR stuff, it's like diversity makes us stronger. And it sounds like a line, but it's it's true because different perspectives, like when they come together can make something new and beautiful. And I love the part you mentioned about empathy because that's something I think we need to remember and relearn perhaps. <laughs> it's so important. Oh yes, always, always yeah. need to be reminded of that. Totally. I apologize. I'm not laughing at you. My dogs are fighting in the background right now. <laughs> like, oh, no. Yeah. Sit. <laughs> She's fine. She's fine. Oh, no. no animals were harmed in the making of this interview. Oh, she is so precious. Yeah, she's a bitch. Oh. <laughs> what? Literally. All right, back to you. Always. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, seriously. No, <laughs> yeah, I was just talking to our third host about this. Like, the media te can teach you so much, and people are always like, I feel like downplaying the representation in it. But really, especially if you're a ch growing up and like pretty isolated, if you're moving around a lot, stuff like that, seeing all of these different situations play out it allows you to like get experience without being directly involved. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I just wanted to bring that up. But how has representation in media changed since you were young? Have you come across any projects where you feel seen? Oh, yes. We are definitely not there yet. But we are we have made so much progress. And I have seen that I continue seeing that. You know, whether that be, you know, I got to the city in 2012. Yes. Oh, I had to think about that. Oh, it's been a minute. <laughs> okay. And like, you know, when I first got here, all of the roles that I was being sent out for were like bus boy and teen drug dealer criminal or illegal immigrant. You know, like those were like the only roles that I was being sent out for. And now I'm, I can see, and I've seen over the years, like, oh, that's changed. Like I can go in for anything now. And people are willing to like visualize seeing a Latino in any role, which is like a huge step. And now we also have, you know, not only lit more Latino representation but also queer representation and we have queer latino representation i mean like love victor is a huge staple piece that i'm so excited to see um so yes we we're definitely on the right path for sure and i'm so excited to see that yeah i agree with all of that and i'm like we're getting we're finally getting to the point where we're starting to see like lead roles too mm -hmm. which is very exciting and very much needed all right. Uh, so in the book, you, you, there's a lot of sage advice for those that haven't read it. Go read it. There's a lot of sage advice in there, including a phrase that you mentioned that I heard too that totally changed my life, which is the fake it till you make it line. So with all the advice in the book, what are you, what are you hoping that readers will take away from you telling your journey of like becoming a successful artist and, and having like a wonderful, happy marriage and happy life? Yeah, I would say the 
the two big takeaways that I I would I really hope people take away. Mm-hmm. I'm so articulate when I'm not written word. Is, <laughs> Have you heard me talk? <laughs> no, <Caitlin>. <laughs> <laughs> Scripts are important. <laughs> is I know. Usually I'm reading from a script, so I'm sorry. That's um, how I start. <laughs> it's okay. I would say the two big takeaways are one, anything you want is possible. No matter who you are, no matter like, yeah, sure, it may be harder or easier, but it is possible. And two, failure is necessary you will fail prepare to fail and failure is sometimes the best thing that can happen to you and so just know that that's going to happen and it's going to be great and it may not feel great for like the literal two minutes you are failing and you're fumbling and you're like oh no this isn't going well but i promise you you will be much 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 better after it and for it yeah, your book is very, very good at making you feel better about yourself. Like, as I, I think I need to reread like the your book every week because I felt so much better when I read it. And then, yeah, I need to read it again because you're very wise and very positive, which I, you don't very get silver a lot lining. Of. <laughs> yeah, that is so encouraging to hear. Thank you so much that was such a huge goal of this book. And, and it's because, you know, growing up or like, like reading or watching queer media, especially everything was so dark and traumatic. You know, I really wanted to just release a big bundle of queer joy into the world. Yes, that was it. And that's, we all want that truly. <laughs> that was a really weird zoom. <laughs> I was like serial killer. <laughs> Oh dear. It reminds me of the office. Like a... <laughs> it's going great. You can go in the other room and have a breakdown. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you're so positive, which we've experienced firsthand now with all of our recording issues that just happened. You you talk so much about being happy in the book, and then I was reading and I'm like, is it possible to be this happy? Is yes. it? I think okay, so. Okay, cool. So I think, there's hope. I definitely think so. <laughs> Living example oh. right here. Yeah. I yeah. go off the rails a lot. Can you tell? Mm-hmm. Um, so back to you. You were part of the Williamstown Theater Festival in 2012, mm-hmm. where you participated in many roles, including stage crew. Did hands-on experience as a crew member enhance your acting at all? Oh, that is such a good, interesting question. I I don't know necessarily if it like helped quote unquote acting, but it definitely helped just being like a better theater collaborator, being a better like like what would it like a like a part of the production because you know when I'm when I'm on stage and or like running backstage and there's also crew members trying to do their job, like I understand what they're doing. Like I understand what needs to be done, like how they're feeling, what they're going through at the time. So like I'm able to, you know, help them out or not leave my kind of costume strewn about all over something that they need to move or like actually put my props away to where, you know, there's just like things that sometimes I do think uh, actors aren't so aware about. Um, so I do, I do feel like it helped in that manner as, as well. Yeah, the, the crew life is difficult. So <laughs> no, knowing to help them is very nice of you. Yeah, of course, because, you know, we're all at the end of the day, we want the production to be the best it can be. And so anywhere we can all help out towards that goal, I'm down for. It also sounds like from some of the descriptions in the book that like behind this, behind the curtains, when there's like costume changes and things like that, it sounds very quick and like pretty chaotic. Oh so. my God. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I did theater as well, so that's why I'm just. I I've had to rip. I had to rip a costume off somebody because mm-hmm. it was stuck and they had to get out. Yep. <laughs> it's usually always very chaotic, but you know we thrive in the chaos. Oh yeah, theater theater life. All right, so 
to pivot a little bit. So the, there's sure. there's a lot of lines in your book that I truly love. And one of them that really was very striking was we can't just sit by and do nothing with all this precious time. So what so you've accomplished a lot like at this point you're you made your own book which is awesome is there anything like do you have any like top achievements or like a bucket list of things you want to do in your career i do have things i want to do i don't know if i have like a top list of achievements uh but i do have things i want to do so you know life is interesting life is i do i like to do a lot of things a lot of different things um, I would like, I'm working on a fiction book right now, a rom-com that I'm excited about. Okay. Hold on. I'm sorry. Can we, okay. After, answer this and then we'll talk about that. Okay. Continue. Sorry. Um, and, and I also, some of my goals are very specific. So this may sound like wild. I love Mariah Carey. She's like my number one. Absolutely love her. I'm a, I'm a musical person. So like, I really appreciate her, her musicality, her compositions, her production. I really love it. And so I'm also, a, I was born and raised in Texas. So even though, you know, I live in New York city and I don't ever foresee myself moving back to Texas, I love country music still. So like Mariah Carey and country music, right? So th where this is going is that <laughs> A bucket list project that I have is I want to do a Mariah Carey country covers album. Ooh, that's interesting. That's a cool goal. Like all new arrangements. Like I want some banjo in there. I want some fiddles. I want, uh, yeah. So it, I have a lot of ideas for that project. Can you that's make one all of the I project. want for Christmas into a country song? Oh my 100%. God. percent. <laughs> we need a remake of that song from her. Yeah. That'd be amazing. So, so I have like things like that and I think I have a few more, but I'll keep them, I'll keep them close to the chest for now. I don't think anyone's questioning how creative you are. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> Bursting with ideas is what it sounds like. Oh my gosh. Um, so one of the things in the book that grabbed my attention, I'm like, oh my God, I need to read a lot more. You were talking about when your brother became a prisoner of war, mm -hmm. which I was, I was like, where the hell did this come from? Like that, that seems so crazy to like go through and just like witness. Yeah. That's and what we thought so at much... the time. <laughs> sure. <laughs> like I, I'm so glad things ended. Okay. Oh, spoiler alert. I'm sorry. They, no, you're they good. You're ended fine. In, a, in a way they ended in a way. Okay. Um, <laughs> So you talked about your parents doing a lot of interviews and there's like a lot of media coverage around it. Did your exposure mm -hmm. to this media so much impact your desire to be a performer and in front of the camera at all? That's a, that's a good question. I, I don't think it necessarily pushed me towards being an actor or like, or like, a you know, in front of cameras, but I do think, that one that experience so young when it happened i was uh for everyone listening i was eight and so experiencing that whole thing so young i do know really taught me how small the world was and it really did make me feel like oh little me from the middle of nowhere texas is now like on tv screens like it was like you can't like things can happen like big things can happen to you like this was a bad thing that kind of happened it ended up being okay but big things can happen so that was like the first like thing that clicked um i the second thing is while it didn't necessarily i think push me towards the acting realm i do think it like watching that happen kind of gave me those first things of like oh like being in front of a camera isn't necessarily scary or or anything. It's just like something my family did. Like it's n it wasn't this big thing now because we had already done it for like big news stations. And so once you've already done done that when you're eight, it's like you know I'm not going to be afraid of being on a stage in high school or something. You know. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I do think it kind of it, it, there were those things that that got instilled in my brain. Yeah, you get to confidence booster it away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, silver lining. Uh, so it seems like, uh, like in the art realm, theater made a huge impact on you. Like you were mentioning, like in, in high school, being exposed to theater. 
Can you talk a little bit about why theater is so important specifically? I think what makes it so great and unique is getting that live experience between whoever is performing and the audience. There's something very special, very sacred and unreplicable about that experience, like having that energy between performer and audience live in the same room, going through those emotions, living those emotions, watching that story happen. And, you know, there have been many, many studies that prove this, that, you know, the there my one of my favorite studies, especially, it's a little different, but one of my favorite studies is when people are singing together in a choir or like just in a group singing together, typically a lot of their heartbeats will sync. And like, it's some, it's just, there's something so magic and human and electric that happens. And that has the power to change people's minds, get people more open to different ideas, get people to be a little more thoughtful and reflective when they're watching a story that, that, is about something very important. And as much as I love TV, as much as I love films, it's just not quite the same. That is a really cool study, first of all. And second of all, yeah, you're right. And there's there's this kind of like real-time feedback happening silently between like performer and audience that's just mm -hmm. unique to having that like in-person experience, like you said. Um, unfortunately, the arts is always battling with like getting its recognition and by recognition, I mean money to keep going. Mm -hmm. uh, and it constantly is getting cut. Do you have any advice of like what people can do to help like support the arts? Oh man, it's, uh, it's, it's real rough out there right now, especially, especially live theater. They are still decimated by the pandemic. And I don't, as of now, as my, as positive and as hopeful as I am in life, I I really still don't see a way where we can get back to post pandemic without huge interventions. Um, so the best things you can do are, if you can, funding. You know, buy a ticket, go see shows, go donate, go become a season subscriber to a theater, your local theater. All of those good things are great. Money is always great. Uh, other things you can do is volunteer your time to to either help raise money or to just be, you know, an usher or or work in the box office. You know, that volunteer, even though you can't give money, you can give your time so they don't have to spend money to to pay someone to do that. And that could be a really great way to help out. Another another thing that I don't know how to make happen, but what we really, really need is I think a grassroots movement starting locally and then to the state level and then, and then to the national level to try to um, lobby for more funding for the arts in all areas. We haven't had anything like that here in this country and we could really, really use it about now. Yeah, that would be wonderful. <laughs> you know, yesterday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I studied entertainment arts management in college, so I was constantly hearing there's no money in theater. Like Broadway shows never make money. Well, mm -hmm. rarely. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's just, it just shows like how much people love it to like still be doing it, even though like it's not going to be as lucrative, I guess, as film and TV. Mm -hmm. So why are you passionate about theater? I'm passionate because, again, like these live experiences can change lives, can, you know, change the course of community thinking, can open those doors of empathy for people who are not like you. It, it is so, so important. It also, you know, when there's theater programs in schools or after school programs, it, it, there are also more studies that show how well it helps for children's development, not only academically, but also socially in building all of those skills. And 
there really is no money. <laughs> and it's like, it's, it's so, especially now when we are seeing, you know, the cost of living skyrocket, especially in the city here, every day I'm seeing more and more actor friends having to leave the business because they can't take, a, they can't live on a project that pays $300 a week or in a huge off-Broadway show that is successful, selling out tickets all the time, and it's $800 a week, which, you know, sounds maybe okay, but not in New York City, and not after you pay your agent, and you pay your manager, and you pay the union, and you pay your taxes in New York taxes, so you're taking home, like, $500 a week. And it's just, it's unsustainable, and I don't know what to do. I wish I had the answer. Yeah. Because like it's it's insane. Like you really have to be all in and a lot of times you have to be well off to even like consider mm -hmm. doing it. And it's unfortunate because there's so many people who be so happy doing it. it when the pandemic happened, we turned to the arts. Mhm. Mm well, obviously not the live theater in person, but Yeah. And it's just people forget how important it is. And especially in the entertainment industry, it's just expecting people expecting you to like work for free and mm -hmm. for very low pay when you're like working so long. It's just, mm -hmm. ugh, I can't, I get, uh, I don't know what the word is, but can you tell like I'm uh, very passionate about that part? Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> It's, it's tough right now. It's very, I mean, it always has been tough, but now it's a new level. And I think we are maybe reaching some sort of what I hope is a turning point and not a breaking point. Uh, but we are, we are nearing something, I think. Yeah. Hope for the best, positivity. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> But moving on from theater slightly, mm -hmm. you were in a segment for What Would You Do? Yes. And the subject matter is definitely difficult for people in the LGBTQ plus community. You had to play a bully who was forcing another teen to come out of the closet. Mm -hmm. What did it feel like having to play this role and be somebody who you're definitely not, but basically like basic, having to portray like the, a nightmare? Yeah, first it was scary because this was, I think, only their second segment they had ever had that was like LGBT themed in any way, shape or form. So it it was a little uh, scary be, just to know how the audiences would react to anything, you know. And then it was also even more scary because it really is real. Like these are strangers that we are interacting with. And um, we shot at a diner in New Jersey. So I wasn't necessarily like, you know, I wasn't afraid of like getting shot or anything like if I was in Texas. Uh, but, you know, they, you know, you never know, you know, how a stranger is going to react and what, what, what's going to happen. But I did feel, feel very safe. There was plants all around from production and they were all literally right there. So I did feel very safe, but you know, you never know like what kind of confrontation you are going to get into. And then I also felt a little uneasy about tricking people and like kind of forcing them into these rough emotional states when they were unsuspected. It, it didn't quite sit that well with me, but I will say, Production was very, very, very awesome in the fact that one, they kept the goal on how this segment would help people and how, you know, there is representation, but also it would bring this issue to light how, you know, you shouldn't force people out of the closet. And then two, production also let us have real conversations with these people after they came out. Like after it was like, hey, by the way, you're on a hidden camera show. You're on What Would You Do? They let us then sit down with them that we tricked, the people that we tricked, and talk to them about it and thank them 
for stepping in and thank them for being a part a part of the process and apologize that you know we kind of tricked them but at the same time it would help so many people and so it was a very interesting and unique and awesome experience at the end of the day how did people react to like finding out cuz you always see people like find out like you're on a hidden camera mm -hmm. show and it's just like you never think that you would mm -hmm. stumble into that. The the beauty, I think, of this segment and of the people who were there stepping in, there was always a huge rush of relief that like, oh, this isn't real. Like this, this isn't real. It was it. This wasn't real. Um, so that was also very heartening to see how much how passionate they were and how much they cared and then when they finally realized oh it wasn't real that like relief that they had that i could see them have um that honestly made me more hopeful than anything that's really beautiful because <laughs> it could have gone the complete opposite way and then just been disheartening for you yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah totally so um okay so we saw that we read too that you were a part of a Springboard NYC. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're we're hoping you can talk a little bit more about the program and what the impact that program has for for actors. Oh my gosh, that is one of the best programs ever. If like you want to be an actor, if you want to be a performer, you want to be work in the theater world in New York, I can't recommend it enough. Uh, I think they still do it. I think they do. Um, basically, you spend two weeks and you're taking master classes from like current Broadway professionals. You are doing mock auditions with casting directors and music directors, all of that stuff. Then they also teach classes that are like how to do your taxes as an actor, how to find an apartment in New York City, like re like actually find a living arrangement. Here's how the bills work in New York City. These, this is what your budget needs to look like in New York City. These, this is like how you find auditions and how to go to the audition. Like it's very so practical things that colleges don't teach. And then like almost every night you're going to see a show. And so it's like really these long days for two weeks. It's really great. And they also have scholarship opportunities. I was a recipient of a scholarship opportunity. I would not have been able to attend the program if I, if I hadn't had that. So I'm very, very thankful. And that program really did set me up to be successful once I moved here. I love that they like taught taxes and stuff like that because yeah, so many people are just getting thrown in to the world and not knowing and i know you talked about like in college teaching your friends about finances and stuff and i just when i was a freshman i was teaching my friends about credit scores and credit mm -hmm. cards and how to build your credit yeah so it's just so important and i don't understand why people don't focus on that anymore yeah it it's wild because it's you can't do anything without that kind of knowledge and and i wish schools would would kind of take it on but i guess i guess we just have to keep like telling people about it to find out themselves i don't know i don't know what we could do like it's just as important as like the tr acting training and stuff mm -hmm. because you're not going to get anywhere if you don't know how to get somewhere yep especially in new york the taxes are wild there <laughs> you gotta learn that stuff so wild well, terminal tax only goes so far. <laughs> I understand. I live in California now. Their taxes are wild too. Mm -hmm. You get it. You <laughs> yeah, get it. I get it. Oh, poor Theora. Uh, you had another very interesting job. And when you were working <laughs> at escape rooms. Oh, yes. Yes. And I found that very interesting when you talked about how watching people play these games like showed you what was going on with humanity. Can you talk about that a little bit more and like how you like saw people through these games? Yeah, it was, it, it's mind blowing because you know, they're in the room, they're trying to do an activity that is a little stressful. So they have that kind of stress put on them. And you know, I think you can tell a lot about someone about how they react to stress. And it 
it's like watching lab rats because they don't they kind of forget you're watching them they don't really know you're watching them so they really just are themselves and there would always be wild things happening all the time i would see like you know it's a lot of families so a lot of the time i saw like a patriarchal figure really put down the matriarch of the family like or like just not listen to her they would be like oh look i found this clue and they'd be like no no we're working on this and it's like ooh, like she has the clue you need um it, it was a lot of like that like microaggressions or like just overt macroaggressions that you saw all the time and then sometimes there would be mixed groups of like people who didn't know each other and so seeing how they would either kind of coalesce and come together to solve it or like not really be comfortable with each other if they were like from different cultures or something it was just you could learn so so much and i did and if there was like a 24 7 live stream of people in escape rooms i think that would be one of the biggest hits on the internet that's all i'll that say that should be a tv show Listen, to be honest. yes <laughs> that'd be amazing <laughs> I don't know if you're on TikTok, but have you ever seen the videos of people working at escape rooms and just like overhearing? I don't know if they're real, but like. Sure. I haven't seen those, but I need to go look at them now because I think <laughs> I can relate. I'll, I'll send them to you. Like, what's the weirdest thing like you've seen or heard? Oh, so many flashes <laughs> of different body parts. Um, oh, dear. <laughs> oh, no. We've had there's been various body fluids oh. um there's been it's just there's a lot it's wild all right somebody's definitely missing an opportunity for a really great show if anyone wants to produce that hit us up hey josh you want to start you want to work on that together sure yeah <laughs> i've got nothing right. else to do once this book is out it's out <laughs> Yeah, and we still well, have to talk about this rom com. Wait a minute, I bad. totally forgot. Forgot about that too. Um, yeah, it's happening. I think. Um, I don't know. I think I'm like half. I'm like the outline's done, and I'm like halfway through first draft drafting it. Wow. We'll That's see, great. and then once once I get like a decent amount, we'll see if there's any there there. I, um. Yeah, I don't know much past that point. I don't know. That's funny. Tell us what truly. it's about. Oh, contemporary uh, gay rom com set in New York. Um, I think that's all I may say about that. About okay. That, so I'm going to need you to finish this book, publish it, and then make it into a movie. Yes. So good. <laughs> oh my god, that is my goal. <laughs> I mean, isn't that everyone's goal? But I mean, <laughs> we need more rom coms. Yes. Uh, they're my favorite okay. yes yeah yes you know ones that don't end in uh tears tragedy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> i would like that we need your yeah. positivity in rom-com form in movie form yes yeah i i would i need that too <laughs> netflix if you're listening yeah. you know what I netflix have doesn't have a great track record yeah. maybe we shop uh, around to some other ones <laughs> Amazon, okay, if you're we can, yeah, we can shop. We can shop around. But ne is, didn't Netflix do single? My favorite one is Single All the Way. Like, if I could they write anything that. half as good as that, I would consider that successful. Okay, well, you know, it's not a TV show, Theora, so maybe one. Netflix is safe. They're good for There's... movies and mini things that end. They're good if you're trying to continue. <laughs> things that end. Oh not, yeah, no, not I'm, I'm not getting movie. canceled after four episodes. Correct, I'm not playing exactly. that game, Netflix. <laughs> no, 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 no. Movies are better. <laughs> Is there like just like a gay cable, like LGBTQ cable network? There used to be. There used to be Logo. Yeah, there did used to be. Oh, Logo. that was and right. then, Logo was. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. now we have. There's a streamer called Reverie, which I think I'm. I'm in a movie on there. I don't know if what? it's still on there. What? Yeah, we we've heard of a few like online. That's that's not it. It's R E V R Y dot TV. Yeah, I accidentally have a jotting that now. I put an F in there for some reason. No, I watched um I think Biffle is on here. So yeah. What are you what are you in, in here? 
Yeah. I, I mean, don't know if it's couple. I don't know if it's still in on here or not. And it may be a couple of things, but I do know one my very first gig ever in the city uh was a short film called Bose Academy. And I think oh. it, it it I know it definitely did used to stream on here and I think it may still be, but I have no idea. So cool. Either way, it's really cool. Yeah. We will go find it somehow. <laughs> <laughs> uh speaking of the city okay so i have some friends who are headed up there soon to see a play Mm -hmm. and since there haven't been new episodes of sweet husbands in a while uh, i'm Mm -hmm. wondering if you have any pastry slash dessert recommendations first we have to explain what sweet husbands is oh yeah so if you're not if you'd like to explain it (laughs) Oh, uh, so Sweet Husbands TV is a dessert and pastry review YouTube show that me and my husband, Matt Tolbert, started and did for a long time. And so you can see, go to Sweet Husbands TV on YouTube and you can see our episodes to get the scoop on all the latest desserts and sweet treats in New York City and and around. We did more than just New York City, but it's like 90% New York City. Um. So yeah, I think, hmm, what's around now that I'm really loving? Ooh, Bear Donut in K-Town is mochi donuts that I highly recommend. They're very, very good. That's a good one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, uh, that's my new favorite find. And then I still love, like, so many of our episodes are about, like, Schmackery's Cookies. Still recommend, um... If they go to Hudson Yards, with which they should, Queens ugh, Queens Yard, I think is what it's called. It's like a restaurant there. It's from London, and they have a location here in Hudson Yards. They have really good desserts and drinks, and they do tea time as well. So, highly recommend them as well. Okay, I will send the segment to them. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. You're very welcome. <laughs> yes. What well, do you know? What play they're going to go see? They're going to see Prima Facie. Okay. I know. I'm jealous. While, while they're here, if they can score a ticket to Titanic. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's the best show I've ever seen. All right. What's it about? I'm not familiar with that one. Okay. So Titanic is a, a parody musical of Titanic. And basically the setup is Celine Dion herself interrupts <laughs> a museum tour like people were touring the titanic museum celine dion interrupts the tour and she's like hey actually i was on the titanic and i can tell you exactly what really happened and she (laughs) she then proceeds the entire show to be the serve as our narrator and our master of ceremonies to tell the story of what really happened on titanic Everything about that sounds. Where's the movie of this? This it's sounds the amazing. Best show I've ever seen, and their social media <laughs> clips are really good right now. Yes. But I got to tell you, the videos on their website do not do the show justice. Oh so God. just know that. Best show I've hey, ever seen. Theora, you want to take a trip to the Northeast? I mean, yeah, I wanted to go with my friends to see Prima, but I just couldn't. It could, tickets were ridiculous to get. But yeah, I really want to see this play. This sounds incredible. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Speaking of incredible shows, I can't believe we don't have this question on here, but you talked briefly about immersive theater, and I didn't really Mm. know that was a thing until this book. And it seems so cool. Yes. Yeah. So, like, teach everybody about immersive theater, please. Oh, oh my God. That's a a whole college course. Um, (laughs) So, you know, immersive theater is is, uh, where typically a show happens all around you. Um, so there are ones like Then She Fell or Sleep No More. I worked on Then She Fell for five years where the whole entire um, show took place in a three-story old abandoned hospital ward. And audience members are kind of taken throughout this entire space while performers are going in and out of rooms with them, performing all around them. There's a very chaotic tea party and dance fight that is like happening where teapots are being smashed, like all right in front of audience members. Um, and it's so it's this half participatory, half watching a show um, experience that is very 
unique and different and exciting. And I really, really, really love it. Um, I've also done ones where we, throughout the entire show, we were in this like huge giant event space with different rooms in a basement. And we would take audience members throughout the space for different scenes. And during the night, they would cook an entire dinner. And then at the very end of the performance, we and the audience all set this giant table for 60 people. And we all sat down and we ate the dinner that we cooked throughout the entire performance. And that was like my favorite thing I've ever done. Wow. That's so neat. <laughs> that is so cool. As you were talking, I just realized I actually did go see an immersive thing, but it was in Greece. Ooh. Yeah. I think it was on in Santorini. Yeah. It was like this whole like family getting married and we we're like in the house and went. So I was like, oh, wait, never mind. Yeah. You, you've done see. this. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't remember though. <laughs> You lived Which, my big fat Greek authentic Greek wedding. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we got smashed plates and everything. It was great. <gasps> yeah. Okay. So yeah. you're you're an immersive theater veteran. It's okay. So now that I know that that's what that was, it is so much fun mm-hmm. and such a unique experience. So, the art. We need to do this. We need to yeah. go f- see it. I love sometime. theater. I just had no idea about like the immersive and it just sounds it just sounds so fascinating because like uh, you're you're a performer but you don't know what you're walking into really if you're an audience member quote unquote Mm -hmm. so that's it's so cool and it sounds like as the as the actual performer (laughs) there's so much you're doing that's like atypical like you said like we're actually making a meal and (laughs) Mm -hmm. it's a lot it's a lot (laughs) yeah but very very fascinating um something else in your book that i picked up was I loved what you said in the very beginning about your book but I know that I can help at least one person with my stories if I can just make one person smile or make one person's brain click that will change their outlook on life then I know I did a great job in my experience I created a documentary and that was like my goal with it the first person you help with projects like this is yourself did writing this book help you at all Oh. Or like, how did you grow from writing it? Man, you are asking great questions that I just, I didn't expect. Um, but I love, I think I was like, oh, that is like Oprah level question. Um, Thank you. <laughs> you're very welcome. <laughs> yes. The, the answer is yes. 1000% more so than I thought. And I don't know if it was necessarily like the writing it all down, um, but I think it's more so the process Mm -hmm. has taught me so much and about like what I'm capable of and what I, what I thought I could do actually was more so what I knew I could do. Like, I just didn't know it. I wasn't like quite that confident. Um, But now I know I can do almost anything I set my mind to. I love that. I made a documentary and I was like, I'm doing this all by myself. I'm going to do every single role. I'm in it. And I'm going to just prove to myself that I can do every single thing. But I don't know where I was going with that. Did did you prove your to yourself that you could i did nice it's on amazon oh my god send it to me please (laughs) sure but with stuff like that it it, it just really makes you think back and i think makes you like process like what you have actually experienced and Mm -hmm. was it like a good reminder for you of things that you've accomplished oh yes and and not only like you know, like things I accomplished, but what it, it, it helped me also remember what obstacles there were for me and maybe what I can focus on whenever I'm looking to like do, when I feel like I want to do something to help the world. Like, I'm like, oh, I know I had all these obstacles. What can I do to remove these types of obstacles for others? Um, Right now I'm working in in the corporate world as a media producer for a tech company. And 
I see, you know, we are like predominantly straight white space. And so I was like, what can I do to make this a better environment for those of us who are from minority? And so I found different ways I can like push things forward and and remove some of these obstacles. And I'm part of the mentorship program or a menteeing and or mentoring. And and I think that writing the book has helped a lot in the in that regard. Yeah, it's very pay it forward. I love that. Always. Yeah. Always, always, always. Always. Well, that wraps up our questions for today. Uh, thank you for answering all of them. Before we sign off and say goodbye to the listeners at home, we wanted to see if you had any final words for our audience. Oh, I would say, you know, I hope you read the book. But even if you don't, no, please just know, read the book. <laughs> please just know that... I'm rooting for you. I think you have a lot more people rooting for you than you think always. And even though you have all of these people rooting for you, you are going to fail still and know that like, you're not going to disappoint the people rooting for you. If you don't like try, you know, they, they will be a little saddened, but like you still won't disappoint them. Just go for it, fail at it. And then try again, maybe if you want to wise words yes so if you want more wise words and positivity please check out joshua's book keep sweet and rate it anywhere you can uh talk about it on social media which we will be doing and just please support amazing artists like joshua okay so, thank you yes and thank you so much for being here this was super fun we really enjoyed getting to talk to you hopefully we'll get to talk to you again and uh that's all we got for today, everybody. Until next time. See you later. Bye bye. And with that, we've been Big Gay Energy. If you like this episode, check out all our other episodes right here on YouTube. Please like, leave a comment below, and subscribe for more amazing super gay content. If you'd like to support us, check out our merch store or join our Patreon for early access to episodes, exclusive content, and so much more. Until next time, stay safe and hydrate for Lesbian Jesus.